welcome everyone. Um, it is nice to see you all for the next installment of By the Book. I am Carrie Adams. I'm the Promotions Director here at the University of Chicago Press, and we are excited to be launching The Perfect Fit. Um, I am going to turn things over to Fernando Domingo, Dominguez Rubio, who is going to be our MC today, and I will let him take it away, and I will put information in the chat on how to buy the book. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being here at this wonderful location. And thank you so much, Carrie and the University of Chicago Press for organizing this. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the, uh, uh, the speakers, and then I'm going to give a brief, hopefully brief, uh, interview, uh, overview of uh, the book. And then we're going to get started with a few questions from the uh, speakers and then hopefully we'll have time to uh, uh, have Q and A's from, from you all. Okay, so let me begin by first introducing uh, the two speakers that are with me today. So one is Harvey Moloch, uh, Emeritus Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis and Sociology at NYU. Uh, he's the author of a number of great and groundbreaking books such as Against Security, Where Stocks Come From, Nerve and Futures. And he's also the recipient of many, many awards and distinctions. And since we have only one hour, I will not go over them, uh, but you can uh, just uh, look them up. And then we have Fiona Greenland, who is an assistant professor at the University of Virginia, and who is the author of an amazing book called Ruling Culture, At Least Tomb Robbers and the Rise of Cultural Power in Italy, which I can recommend high enough, especially if you're interested in current debates about cultural heritage and how cultural heritage is intertwined with nation building and politics. And uh, I am Fernando Dominguez Rubio. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Communication at UCSD. And I'm the author of a book that by any rational measure is too long. Uh, it's called Still Life. Um, anyway, so, and then we have, of course, uh, Claudio, uh, the Agasajado, uh, the celebrated, who is an associate professor at Northwestern uh, University, the author of two books. The first one is The Open Fanatic, uh, which was the winner of the Meredith Girls Prize uh, when it was published in, two, in 12, right? Uh, 2012, I think. And The Perfect Fit, which is the best ex uh, is the excuse for this uh, uh, gathering uh, today. Okay, so those are the speakers. And then what I'm going to do is to give you a little bit of uh, an overview of the book for those of you who haven't read it. And then uh, we get started. Okay, so. First thing I want to say is that I think that is important to underline the celebratory nature of this occasion. Uh, academia is a really unforgiving place, which condemns us to live permanently on trial, always subjected to the critique of peers, fearing the ire of the infamous reviewer too, as well as the hell of living under the permanent assessment of our institutions where we work. So I think it's important to take a break from that logic of critique and assessment and cherish those spaces and moments where we can come together just to appreciate and celebrate the work we do and the milestones we achieve. Uh, and the publication of a book is one of those milestones. And I think that in this case, it's actually pretty easy uh, to be celebratory since Claudio's book is a uh, Turkish delight. Uh, so just to, uh, uh, you know, to give you an idea of where I come from, I was one of the reviewers of the book, and I'm going to read you the first uh, three paragraphs that I read as uh, for the review, just to see that actually my love for this book is actually honest and sincere. So this is what I wrote is like, let me begin by saying how extraordinarily difficult it has been to adequately fulfill my duties as a reviewer for this manuscript. Reviewing is usually a straightforward task, since it is relatively easy to detect things that need attention and correction in a manuscript. In this case, however, uh, uh, I couldn't find much to say. As a result, I've been forced to spend a great deal of time and effort to come up with something intelligent or a minimum useful to write for this review. As a matter of fact, at several points, I was tempted to give up and write a one-line review simply saying, this is a wonderful book, please publish it as is. I haven't done so because of the pang of consciousness that have ultimately forced me to write a lengthy review and thus alleviate my guilt in laying claim to the $150 worth of books that the University of Chicago is offering me. So I ended up doing a lengthy review, but out of just guilt, uh, uh, 
you know, in, in this idea of I have to sound intelligent somehow. Thankfully today, my task is much easier. I don't need to come up with any witty critiques uh, to come off as intelligent in front of you, which is a huge relief. Uh, and the only thing that I can do today is I can devote myself to seeing the praises of this book as a shameless groupie, which is where I am. Uh, so there are many things that I think that I love about this book. Uh, one has to do with something that I have to uh, come to appreciate more and more over the years, which is an appreciation for those books that are written, that are not written against anything. They're not trying to debunk or to take down or to score a point in some sub, 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 sub field. Uh, and are just written to invite us to learn about a corner of the world that we're not familiar with and open up the possibility to think about it together. And I think that this is what this book uh, does. It, uh, it invites us to see that rather peculiar corner of the world where high-end women's shoes are done. And I think that the book, you can say that largely is a book about globalization or more specifically about the global change, chains that produce shoes. Now, funny, I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of books on globalization. And one thing when I started to read the book is that, you know, if a PhD a student of mine was to come to me and tell me that they want to study globalization, I would probably ask them not to do it because it's like, what are you gonna say more about globalization? It's like, you know, saying that water is wet. And Claudio, of course, has uh, proven me wrong by showing why it is always possible to study and say something new. Uh, because it's never just about concepts and theories, it is about stories and the stories that we tell. And I think that this is a story about how the global is done every day and how it is undone. And it's a story that is told from a very particular point of view. And I think that that is actually one of the beautiful things about the book and is the point of view of the shoes and feet. And that's how we look at globalization from that perspective. So rather than approaching the global from uh, the top down as it has been the, normally the case, we're invited to approach it from the bottom up from the perspective of uh, shoes and feet. And this inversion, I think, opens up a host of actors, forms of labor, practices that have always, uh, always been absent in analysis of uh, globalization. We learn a lot. We learn, for example, about the various lives of designers traveling from New York to Europe to China as they try to come with new designs. We learn about how the global chains come to depend on finding a right, the right foot. Uh, and how finding the right food is what allows process of standardization and globalization. We learn about the search for that price perfect food and about the Chinese shoe models. And uh, we learn about the struggles to translate and standardize the difference between US calves and Chinese calves, for example. Uh, and we learn about how this robust global network can come to an end uh, when uh, Claudio takes us to Brazil, to uh, Novo Hamburgo a place that is consumed by the bittersweet aftertaste that bygone futures and promises leave behind. I think that the mastery of the book is that it manages to put together, I don't even know how many field sites, it's probably five or six, um, I lost count. And instead of creating a disjointed collage, uh, what you have at the end is a beautiful and cogent story that adds uh, much nuance and texture to existing narratives about globalization, and that help us to see globalization as a messy, complex and contradictory uh, process. I think that we learn a lot about the fundamental uh, unsettledness of social order, how fragility and stability are not and never opposite, but are always the same. And one thing that I was constantly reminded of is this book by Alexei Durjak uh, um, that is called Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. And I think that that is one of the things that for me is one of the stories of this, this, this book is, you know, how globalization is forever until it is uh, no more. Now, I must confess that I find the success of the book a bit concerning as well. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Because if you think about it, the what I think about it is that, okay, so this is a kind of book that sounds like a completely unrealistic plan that first year grads come uh, when they want to do a research and they say, okay, look, I'm gonna study these shoes and I'm gonna study in five locations. And you have to sit down with them and say, look, uh, why don't you choose one site? And that's probably enough to get us going. 
And now this is a book that actually has done that. So I don't know. I mean, now they're going to kind of say, look, actually, this book has done that. You know, they, they have like five. He has like five different field sites and he still managed to, um, to pull it off. Uh, so I don't know if I should actually discourage grads from reading the book uh, to save uh, headaches uh, when I have to advise them or if I should actually tell them, okay, yeah, actually you can go ahead and do that. Okay, so I think that that's what I wanted to say as a way of opening remarks. I do have questions, but I think that, you know, I, I have spoken too much. I always speak too much. So uh, I'm gonna go to Fiona and then to Harvey, uh, and then we can start the discussion. Hopefully we have time also for you to um, jump in. So Fiona. Thanks. Thanks for the kind introduction, Fernando. Um, Claudio, what an achievement. Congratulations. Such an honor to be part of this conversation. Um, Fernando's absolutely right that this book is an achievement. Um, and what this book gave me new perspective on was how much of an achievement is the shoes that we wear on our feet. So for everybody who's on the Zoom call wearing shoes, and if you're not, I don't judge you, it's a Zoom call, but um, there is no reason why those shoes are inevitable. Like one of the things that Claudio does so brilliantly is take us through this process and identify just why it's so precarious to build out a shoe. Any number of things can go wrong. A design can be scrapped before it gets off the design board. Um, the leather might be worked at the wrong time of day. The lats don't come in. Somebody misses a connecting flight from JFK to Beijing. Um, what makes it work is people. And so the relationships that you tease out across these many vectors of design, collaboration, um, and um, I guess we could say like the contribution of different ideas and materials is what helps stretch out this entire process of uh, design. Um, so, you know, Claudio, this is a book that is in so many ways a perfect fit for you, given your tremendously rich scholarship on object attachment. So one thing that really hit home for me was how these multiple people who intersect at different points are all attached to the final product. Um, and, and you made me rethink design. So I want to, um, having said all of that, want to ask you questions that are bundled into two buckets. And one is about design, and then one is about uh, gender. So thinking about design sociologically is tricky because we have a way of thinking about creativity, but then design thinking has traditionally been influenced by our cousins working over in art and design. And there, a lot of the work is on solutions-oriented collaborations. So one thing I think you do that's important and different is show that design can be question-oriented, not solution-based, and in a way, building out possibilities in multiple directions. And each time a step is achieved and um, a new creative um, iteration comes about, it's as though these people are creating new possibilities for more creative work. So one thing I'd really like to hear from you is about how your ethnography can help us to understand creativity from below. So what we have in this story overall is how these shoes go from the designer idea to the shop floor. And much of the work in sociology of art, where I spend a lot of time thinking, shows us the problem of coordinating action from the um, artist at the top or the design agent who's in charge of the project, trying to coordinate the actions and activities of the underlings. You've actually given us the perspective of, the, of those underlings. So tell us what are some new insights we can take to think about sociology of creativity and creative agencies at all of these micro steps. So that's the first bucket, design. I wanna ask you now about gender. I think one of the outstanding features of this book is how you problematize the ways in which we have made assumptions about the gender segregated nature of the fashion industry. And three of the women who stand out for me in your ethnography are Brenda, Connie, and Linda. 
Linda, who is the queen of the fitting room. And they populate the pages of the book throughout, but they really come to life in chapter five. I wanna read one of your passages from that chapter. This is where you talk about fit model's feet being discovered to match close enough the um, ideal measurements of each foot. This is what you write. You say the power of discovery and its charismatic inscription on the measurement sheet is such that it allows the woman who was until then just an office girl to transform her self-identification in an instant. Someone imbued with special character and as such able to cross certain professional and gender boundaries that had been sealed before. I will confess that upon first reading, I wasn't convinced by that argument. It took me a few goes to understand the kind of agency that Connie and Brenda and Linda bring to this endeavor. I think it goes beyond micro modifications of the height of a heel or the placement of a strap. But the reason I remain torn is that I see much of the fashion industry as um, antithetical to the mama or comfort shoe buyers, that sea of product in Ohio. Um, are there limits to how much they can really be transforming things? Um, would you say that much of their agency is limited to the creative domain? Or what are some broader lessons we can, we can kind of take out from all of this? Like, what did you see in your field notes, um, these moments in the book when we understand this design work to be undergoing multiple shifts in agency and uh, position. Um, and can is there maybe a limit to which some of that is actually standardized, even as the products undergo these um, incredible standardization processes across ethnicity, nationality, time zones, and, um, and social groups? So Fernando, I think that probably takes me to a good stopping point and probably a good moment to um, pass it over to Harvey for the next set of questions. Uh, Claudio, such a treat to have this book, such a gift to all of us, and thanks for convening us. You're gonna go ahead, Harvey, you're muted. Yeah, that's the bingo. We already said it. There we go, now I'm on. Um, uh, so first of all, um, yes, thank you for inviting me, uh, Fernando, and uh, your comments about the first uh, time you received the manuscript. Um, uh, you know, in preparation for this, I said I was going to just agree with everything you said, but I didn't realize the degree to which what you wrote to the University of Chicago Press is exactly what I would have said to the University of Chicago Press and uh, what is uh, on my mind for now which is that um, I just think this is a wonderful book and I can save everybody a lot of time and they can switch me off at any moment, except you shouldn't because we have to engage in um, a, a very useful conversation um, and, um, and, and, and that's what's gonna happen. I wanna ask, um, uh, we were told to have some questions for Claudio and I did not indicate this one for Claudio ahead of time. I wanna ask him now though, Claudio, are you serious? And by that, a question I want to ask you is, how far will you take this? Because I see it, um, and I'm using this now as a, as a, um, a push on you uh, to get the, the how far you want to go, um, is that, is this a model for society, period, full stop? This is not just a way to do the sociology of aesthetics or globalization but this is the way the world works. And when I um, ask that question, um, I have in mind things um, uh, like the, uh, the current war in Europe um, and how it started, how it's carried on day by day, how the globalization of it works. Um, I have in mind um, um, uh, the March of Folly, Barbara Tuckman's understanding of things like World War I and how it got going and how it persists. And how can we get from the shoe to World War I? Um, and how do we get to the, from the shoe to the current war? And um, I wanna answer it by pulling some things out of your, out of your writing and out of your book. Um, so um, there is an, an indeterminacy that is going on. 
because so much happens uh, to make a, a particular shoe of diverse elements coming together in unpredictable ways, such that one of those ways, yes, gets sort of frozen in the end. And you describe exactly how that a freezing uh, occurs such that it's that shoe. And I would say um, the Treaty of Versailles uh, um, is, is a fix in the same way that a shoe style is a fix. Um, uh, or am I going too far with you? Um, am I pushing this uh, beyond what is plausible um, and, and what is reasonable? Trial and error to produce a shoe. It's not a genius designer or even a corporate mogul. It's trial and error. Move the strap a little this way, a little that way. Put it on a different model because her foot isn't quite right for that shoe. Uh, she shouldn't be showing it on uh, in Milan. She should be in a shopping mall in Ohio. Uh, all of these things are determining the outcome of what the shoe is actually going to be. So the indeterminacy of history, the trial and error of history, and the aesthetics of history, which is that I like that. Um, and I don't know why I like that. I don't have to say why I like that. I do like that. And there is a vocabulary for liking it. And everybody has that vocabulary. And indeed, I've, been, I've never been to Bulgaria, but I have an opinion about Bulgaria. It has an aesthetic orientation to me, Bulgaria. And it would, might just influence me whether when I was deciding whether to invade or not to invade, provide assistance or not provide assistance. It just might be there. So I think this book is also a way of understanding aesthetics, not as a field, but as an aspect of being uh, in the world and its consequentiality um, in what are unpredictable ways, especially as they combine uh, with other items. I think that this is a, um, a, a kind of uh, Latourian project um, in my reading of it. Uh, and that is what we, are, what we are learning is, is just how it is uh, that an assemblage is socially produced through macro phenomenon, which uh, Fiona has spoken of and, uh, and you, uh, other people have as well, through macro phenomena such, such as we associate with globalization, but through micro projects that are recurrent in different forms. And, and in this book, we learn in different parts of the world and how those different projects in fact um, end up in some sort of coordinating way that would be very difficult to predict ahead of time. Uh, and, yet, um, and yet they occur. So I think what you're doing is a kind of uh, ethnography of, a, of assemblage of how it is actually done through these kind of micro projects with macro consequences. The e e economies of regions fall on what happens in this industry. Uh, and as you show what didn't happen in this industry um, as things don't work out. The other question that I finally wanna ask you is, um, so I see this by way, shoe as method. Uh, that's what I think you've done is the shoe as method uh, for many other for many other things. Um, and um, one of the things that happens is that one region of the world loses its shoe industry um, and goes into uh, a decline. But you don't quite specify what that decline is. We get an idea. I want to know, uh, or I'd like to know if you have time is uh, what's left when these realms of economy, not heavy industry, but something that's heavy-ish, uh, 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 deserts or goes away or uh, because these fashion industries are doing that as well. So that's my uh, question as well. How far, uh, how far do you wanna go with this? Uh, are you Max Weber? Let me put it that, that way to you. Uh, how far do you want to go? Uh, so uh, I'm going to um, put my question. 
I, I hope that you answered the one about whether you are Max Weber uh, first, uh, uh, because that would clarify a lot of things. Uh, but I'm going to put, uh, so my question uh, is, uh, it's not a question. I mean, it's ask, to ask you to talk a little bit more about something that I particularly like about this book. So I think that one of the things that really fascinated me about the book was the subplot about how keen uh, friendship and intimate relationships work as the connective tissue in that makes the micro and, uh, and micro projects that Harry was talking about possible. And uh, and I think that one of the things that uh, really interests me about the book is that you know uh, like these huge projects like globalization and scale making is not just a matter of standards of networks of expertise is is about that but it's also about something that takes place with the with intimate lives and affects uh, created by a keen and effective relationships there was a uh, um, subtitle in one of the sections that is global intimacies i think and i and i really like that idea of uh, you know uh, globalization being an intimate project as well, uh, uh, yeah, something that is fed by that. And without that, you can have all the standards, all the infrastructures, all these huge things, but it wouldn't work in the same way or it wouldn't or, or it would collapse, right? So I, I just wonder if you can talk a little bit more about these, how these uh, uh, relationships uh, are the oil in the machine in a way. That's it. So I guess now it's my turn. So I'm going to start, of course, thanking Carrie for putting this event together, Elizabeth Branch Dyson for being my fantastic editor for this project, Molly McPhee. Also, I just saw Kyle Wagner somewhere over there. So I also want to take like a time to thank him, who you know used to be part of the sociology series when this all started. And of course, these three fantastic commentators. I mean, I don't know if Harry, like if Harvey remembers. But we had lunch once in New York because I told him I didn't want to write where stuff come from with shoes. And so basically it was like a conversation to see what else, where I could go into. And apparently this had led me into the, are you serious kind of uh, <laughs> um, The other thing I wanted to say before I answer formally all the stuff like and, and echoing Fernando is that to me, this is like that weird moment where you're christening the ship, right? Like, so you're breaking the champagne and then hopefully I don't have to talk for the book anymore in the same way that the feed models don't have to talk for the shoes anymore. Uh, and, you know, starts traveling on its own to the sort of uh, watering uh, like seas of uh, sociology and other conversations that we have. And, and of course, I'm super moved to see so many friends fellow travelers, co-authors, former students, etc. So, you know, this is like, uh, I'm going to try to be intelligent, but also, um, as you can imagine, I'm pretty happy and moved by what I'm seeing. So let me see if I can start, I'm going to start with like the other way around. So I'm going to start with Harvey, just because this is how I wrote my notes, then with Fernando and I end with Fiona, if that's okay with you. So the, no, I'm not, I'm not Max Weber. <laughs> I would honestly answer, and I don't know like the the how far will I take this. Partially because I'm someone who I think think of all these things in very modest terms, in terms of like what we can do as we do these kind of things. And so for me, it was more, you know, theorizing is an exercise in like when there's data that you don't know what to do with, or does it make sense to you early on, or is puzzling in some way, and so. Like, I don't know what it would entail then for me to go into a general model of this. At the same time, as anybody that has followed the coverage of the war on Ukraine or the lapsus lingua yesterday of former president Davia Bush knows, uh, you know, there's nothing more double standard aesthetics than saying, you know, Ukrainian people are getting bombed. They're just like us. They have Instagram accounts. I mean, these are an actual article from a new British newspaper saying this, right? Like they're blown. I mean, the, that was the only thing that was missing. As if Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Palestine, you know, and on and on and on, depending on the time of history that you're like focusing on, didn't deserve the sense, same sense of humanity because, you know, they're probably aesthetic displeasing, right? Like they're not quote unquote like us, uh, even if they are actually, right? So 
Like, I don't know if this book is a model for answering those things, but I do feel like I completely agree, right? There's like a sense of like aesthetics in a lot of like how we inhabit the world and, you know, probably trying to capture that in an industry that, you know, like when it has been studied, it hasn't been studied for aesthetics, right? Like, I mean, there is a quote in the book, the famous Benjamin book, like a quote of like, there's no document of culture that isn't a document of barbarism. And I completely agree, but like there's, you know, we got to investigate power so much that we got paralyzed to the point of not understanding that there's like a creation of meaning, of pleasure, of inhabiting the world, like in a particular way, right? And so, and I think in order to understand the other part, right? Like that we keep buying cheap, you know, shoes that are cheap, even though there's thousands of documentaries and books and newspaper, fantastic journalistic coverage on what happens at the factory. If we go, well, things are also done beautifully, right? And so in order to understand that, if you go to the factory, you don't understand anything. But if you go to like development and design, then you get to see what are like the challenges and like the things to study. Um, so I would say shoe as a method. And again, going back to, if I can put in Fernando's, I would never advise a grad student to do this. I would never either, because this wasn't the original project as you can imagine. My original project was like an ethnography of designers in New York. But then because of the relational character of the assemblage infrastructure, whatever way name we can give to this, it didn't make any sense. It's like, I was just studying, you know, like, like a 20% of like the actual process and I wouldn't have been able to like figure things out. And so it was the iterative character of like finding, you know, like the, in, in a way it's like, I think my method, the shoe as a method is very similar to like the book, right? Like I do feel like there's something where it's iterative and it's problem solving and it's, where should I go next, like to understand this, you know, which of course was, you know, very challenging and exhausting and I'm never gonna do this again, I promise. Um, so I, I would say that, I mean, I came in of course, and I think like Harvey and Fiona had this question on like design to a certain extent, right? Like, and how you go beyond some of the more classic things of sociology of creativity. And I think there's an interesting tension, right? Because I did enter thinking, oh, this is going to be like mass. I mean, these are like mass commodities, you know, like, so this is going to be instrumental, boring, repetitive, alienating kind of work. And then it ended up that it wasn't for anybody of the people involved, you know, and part of it is the problem solving quality of it. So technicians would tell you every shoe is a different shoe. And, and you know, and like, at first I was like, okay, that's bullshit. You know, like you're, you're trying to romanticize your profession and whatnot, but the reality it is. And there is something, you know, very compelling in terms of focus, of attention, of attachment, as you put it, Fiona, like when you think of these things, right? Um, but the second one, part for sure, is like sort of like the, the aesthetics themselves, right? Like the fact that you have to have like a, I mean, and that's an interesting thing about how to think of sort of the semiotics of capitalism, right? That what you are seeing is actually, you know, like the details is actually like the most important part of the thing, because you're you know, producing commodities that actually have to be singular, singularized, right? Like you're producing commodities with the idea that like this shoe is gonna speak to someone in this particular market, in this way that's gonna go and buy it and fantasize with this in this way, right? Which I think it's something that's, some, and, and you can see it every step along the way, right? Like in the mood boards of the designers, in like how the materials are work, but also in the fact that the fit models have to be trained by a brand you know, and they get so many shoes from the brand that they have, you know, they have to walk with those shoes like during their time off and whatever, kind of to inhabit the sense of style of whatever was the particular brand, right? And so, you know, that is like that tension that you're mentioning between the, the aesthetical part and if you wish the problem solving because they also get the shoes as problem solving because sometimes like after five days of wearing them, they start noticing, you know, there's a problem, right? Like, in, in the heel or there's a problem in the intersection between the leather and like the, what's now called vegan leather in the industry. It doesn't have anything to do with leather, right? Like, and, and, and things of the like. Um, so the question of, uh, of Harvey, of sort of what's left behind kind of, and the third part of the book, it's kind of an exercise in cost, contrast sorry, and comparison, right? Because I think like the, the fascinating thing that I ended up, you know, like, understanding is that, you know, the book happens in South China mainly and in New York. And then I go to South Brazil, which is where they, 
the shoes for this particular market segment were produced in the 80s and 90s before they moved to China. Um, and so there's like almost two things that we can learn from that following on Harvey. One is the interdeterminacy in, of that project because these were parts of the world that were not united. You know, like one circuit basically exploited all of Europe after worlds or dictatorships and then Brazil. And the other circuit was the one that Taiwanese like entrepreneurs did like with same thing, like Japan after the second world war, Korea, then like Taiwan, Hong Kong, then the mainland when it opened like in the eighties. And I think the interesting thing is if the American buyers hadn't like allied with Brazilian um, factory owners and open a factory in South China, bringing in all the skilled expertise because the Taiwanese were not doing expensive shoes. They were making like injection things and you know all the stuff that in the eighties for people who are old like me, remember everything was made in Taiwan, everywhere around the world, right? And so they were unable to do like the shoes. And then China actually still Chengdu in, in Sichuan province is like the sort of the national capital of like shoemaking. It's not like Donghua. But the interesting thing, and I'm, I'm saying all this because I, when I started research, the place that I went to was like an expert cluster, but it was every trip that I took, like the factories disappear or they move into like a worse area of like the region or they had to slim down or, and, and so it became kind of fascinating because at first it was, okay, I'm contrasting the boom. I mean, I saw Chad somewhere over there brought on. So to quote him, like the boom of uh, the particular like a moment in time. But the reality is when I got to Donghua, Donghua was already starting to be more like Novo Hamburgo, right? Like the only thing that you started having were like the expert cluster services, but the cheap labor was moving away. And that's the interesting thing that I think like sinking through shoes allows you is that there's a disjuncture between expert work and cheap labor. And, you know, like, and sort of the temporalities that they have. And this is like a classic question for geographers, for political economists, right? Which is sort of the, um, the question of, you know, like how fast labor and capital move, right? And in general, you know, we tend to have the fantasy that, you know, like you just say, okay, we're living, bye, thank you. <laughs> and, the, and the reality is like, you need like these cadres of experts almost as a condition of possibility of exploitation. And usually, we haven't studied that. We study the managers, like the people that do the surveillance, the control in the factories, like and that interface, but we haven't gone like beyond that. And so I thought this was, and again, in a very serendipitous way, because I didn't know these were like the two com main components of the shoe industry, like an interesting way of like uh, thinking of that. And then, you know, what's left behind is, uh, you know, it's a mixture, I would say of, infrastructure, right? Like left behind infrastructure, all kinds of things, right? Like abandoned factories. And so I took a lot of pictures of factories in these moments of decomposition, uh, which tells you a lot about how empty and abandoned they are. The fact that there could be some weird stranger just like climbing walls, trying to take pictures of the inside with no security. So I think that's, you know, already telling enough beyond what I saw on the inside. But also the other thing is like, you end up in a town that's inhabited by ghosts, right? Like because everything in that town remits to like the explosion of the shoes in the 80s. There's like museums, streets, monuments, you know, on top of like the actual building, building structure. And then, you know, if you are going places, there's no cab driver that's gonna like, you know, like they're gonna start talking to you and say, oh, you know, like here used to be the factory Hermanos Müller. Here used to be. And so, you know, like it was fascinating to see how that tension between sort of melancholy and nostalgia, right? Like things were not fully dead, but they kind of were and what people did with that. And interesting enough, because of COVID and what happened with China and the lockdown and whatnot, some production is coming back to Brazil. But the expert cluster in Novo Hamburgo is still doing like very fancy stuff. It's just like, like the cheap labor in Brazil is also moved somewhere else, right? So that's the other part of the thing. Like even when you think of the unit as China or Brazil, it's not really China or Brazil, right? Like it's internally differentiated uh, in many different ways. So let me go to Fernando and the global intimacies. And so I would say the main reason why it's, I would say it's thematized but not fully developed is because of the kind of access I had to this data. You know, like I, I had a lot of access to things, but people didn't know who I was exactly. 
where, you know, where for all the other stuff that I report on the book they did. And so I felt it was slightly unfair to be reporting on like end of the year parties, you know, like Brazilian cavalquino and guitar sessions by the technicians for the, you know, like the Chinese, like office girls and, and things like that, because I was there kind of like as the companion, you know, I, speaking of global intimacies, as a partner of a designer which is like the way in which I, you know, started getting access to this. And so in some of the ways I've been in all kinds of different scenarios with some of these people, but to me it was like kind of hard to really report the data and it was more like, I'm gonna thematize this. But like one thing that I always thought on top of the fictive kinship, I mean, you know, we know that our kinship is fictive, but still like in this case, it's a little bit more pronounced and exaggerated, right? Like you end up with like couples, pairs, right? Like the model and the technician, the technician and the designer, right? And also with like different rhythms of the relationship, right? Like you can be very close because then you leave for a month, you come back. So like, even if you think of it as a couple, right? It works like in very interesting ways and also how you build intimacy face-to-face -face and virtually, right? The other thing that I thought and I ended up not writing it, which I think my, you know, my advisor at grad school, Craig Calhoun will be mad about, is like, I thought of calling it cosmopolitanism from below, right? Because the amount of like inter I mean, if you're thinking of these, these are like migrant workers within China becoming friends with Southern Brazilians who at most finished high school or did a technical degree in order to work on shoes, right? So when we think of cosmopolitanism, we never think of this, right? Like we always think of like high, you know, high-end flying academics and, and all kind of economics like Davos, Davos Forum, diplomacy, but we never think of like, you know, like these kind of workers and how they get along with each other and how they become friends and how they end up participating in weddings. You know, like I went to a wedding in Taiwan of the woman who's called Grace on the, on the book, for instance, right? Like, and, and so you end up becoming like so close and like people are in New York and even though they're exhausted by going and going and going to China for work, they tell you they miss the people in China because after you go six, seven times a year for two or three weeks, you know, like, and you're working the whole day, then you're having dinner, then like, you know, like you really think, and it's not like a work to think, like you think of them as your friends in different ways, right? Um, so I agree. I think there's something where, and absolutely by chance, like the, the book ended up being kind of like an inversion of the global as this huge thing. And it became like focused on like body and then abstracting on a foot even more. And on this like small, like oh, everything is small, like the techniques, the devices, but also like you're saying, like the intimacy. And, and the most interesting thing of this intimacy among strangers, uh, you know, that, that Fiona was mentioning, the crossing over ethnic, racial, national, gender lines, right? Because there's all those lines, not just gender, like in these fields. Um, but it's also interesting because it ends up in, let's say the fit models, you know, like having to imagine have never having been in Ohio, you know, like what is it that like a woman from Ohio, which is like an abstract content, and again, for whatever reason, everybody's fixated on the Midwest, including like the Taiwanese production managers, the Brazilian technicians, so like Ohio, you know, like <laughs> a name, but, like they also given like other, but I, I love the idea of Ohio because of that, but they have to, you know, develop sort of like this empathetic magic, right? They have to think of themselves as someone that's trying the shoe not for themselves, but like knowing what the brand has done before, they start thinking, is this gonna be enough? Is this gonna be good, right? And, and going off Fiona's sort of like, I think the interesting tension is like a very almost simelian tension, right? Because you know, like the pair between the technician and, and the fit model, you know, and there you have almost like a gradation, right? At the, at the beginning, the, the, the fit model is just a foot, then if they develop a vocabulary, the question is whether they're being like, you know, a mannequin, like almost like with the, you know, being the ventriloquist, the, the technician. But then when the designers come, that whole thing changes. It's like, a, it's a trial instead of a diet. And all of a sudden they are asked for their opinion aesthetically and otherwise, you know, like how does it fit in comparison? Because for technicians, the important thing is, you know, like if things are put together properly, right? Like, um, and, and let me maybe comment on like the nature of like the, the authority and how is it different from other things? It's like, it's a, when I started the project, people were like, oh, what about men's shoes? Well, men's shoes are not interesting because there's two or three constructions. That's all you need. We all use Chelsea boots, the same like two or three things. They, they change the color, they change the upper, 
but nobody's breaking quote unquote a new construction and you last for this. And so there's no male fit model of importance, you know, because you're doing the same construction over and over, you just change the top. Same thing with sneakers, you know, like here and there, of course, they break like a new sneaker and we hear about it and there's a line, you know, across NYU, right? There was something on Lafayette where people were camping out the whole day waiting for like sneakers, but that doesn't happen to be the case. But for, for women's shoes, it's not just the upper, it's not just like the upper, but the construction, right? And because of that, all of a sudden you have this, you know, like kind of a particular, like, you know, like figure, role, person, all those things together, thing, right? Because that's the, the thing like in there that, that you have to like take account of. And again, before I saw one email early on, you know, with somebody in a sample room in China explaining, hold on, they might, I we're sending you the pictures, but it's a different woman than the usual one. I was like, who cares? Right, like it's, and they were like, no, no, no. Like you care because like you learn to see all the small deviations and details that like had put the infrastructure together for that company. And that's why like they become important. And so I think you were talking about Linda, who I call the, the queen of the, of the fitting room. Because she was someone that, you know, like, and, and going back to Harvey and the Laturian parlance, you know, like she became a mediator instead of an intermediary, right? Like she wasn't just, and I think that's the part that is interesting. Like it's how, how and when are these people objects and treated like objects that just render information and when do they become subjects that affect, right? Like the whole process of putting the assemblage together. And you know, and someone like her affected in an interesting way because she became so good proficiently technically that would save you a lot of money. If you hire her like as a freelancer, she had the technical capability to try the shoes and say, do this, do that, do the other. And that's a, you know, a big saving of money because otherwise you have to send it to New York, probably like try it on, on the feed model there, see if it works, see if it can pack, see what are the specifications. And so, um, you know, like, but at the same time in that sort of infrastructural inversion, there's a question of, you know, what can indeed be disembodied, formalized, you know, and what kind of like skill, like, sorry, skill acquisition is being afoot, right? And so, you know, like in coming back to the food, and again, I see Andrew Dinner here, who's like the champion of pushing the question of internal variation and nuance for everything you find. <laughs> you know, like it became like an interesting gradation, right? Like when is it that they're a mannequin? When is it that they're a ventriloquist doll, right? When is it that they're a megaphone? And so for that, well, you have to go to different feedings, different pairs, you know, like, you know, and, and things of the like, you know? But then it's interesting because the food, like you put it, like becomes abstracted from the body and it becomes a synecdoche for the whole person. So people talk about people uh, and they're actually talking about the food, yeah? So they say, oh, it's chunky and this and that. And then you meet the person and it's like this five, four, very spelled person. And you're like, okay. I, they were making, you know, like sort of like fun, you know, like sort of fun of the person. And, and literally it was because they were anthropomorphizing the, the food as if it was the whole body. Same thing with like the small details, right? Like the idea of, you know, this food is too good, right? Like too unique, too fantastic. So of course, like any ornaments we put on it, they're gonna look fantastic. But once again, what is it gonna look like in Ohio, right? And so, you know, like there's like all those uh, tensions at play. Um, and then I don't know, I think you have the, the theorization question. And I'm, I'm just gonna be, again, very like push it to the side in some ways. Like to me, this is like our worlds, but like on a different scale. And to me, this is like laboratory studies. And so to me, the, the interesting thing is, it's almost like the legacy of sociology of work of, you know, Hugh, Strauss, Becker, became Lee star, right? Like, and so it's super clear how to do these things if you look at like the, you know, like the sociology of like knowledge. But for whatever reason, you know, even though we have Gary, Fine, you know, we have a lot of really great people done work. Like there's something where it's almost like, we all say, yeah, our words, our words. But actually we haven't gone into the nitty gritty detail of seeing all the connections when they escape you know, something that is filled or bounded or whatever you want to call it, right? And so that's why, you know, I follow Fernando's lead in this in calling that like the ecological perspective in the classic sense, right, of the Chicago thing, because to me, the question that organized and started the book is like, how, how did everything get there, right? And at some point I had to stop, 
Because otherwise, you know, Elizabeth wouldn't have published a 700 page book on like leather, different cuts of leather, you know, like the amount of in insanity that you enter in the rabbit hole of technical detail. Like at some point you have to like come back and start thinking what are like the big lines of argumentation. Anyway, I'm gonna stop here just in case there's any question comments for the last seven minutes. Thank you to all of you so much. So I think that is a good moment if people in the audience want to uh, uh, ask a question or a comment, uh, this is the time. Uh, Fatma. Okay, thank you so much for this amazing, amazing work. Uh, and I think uh, your work, as people have said, uh, culture enables you to go beyond this divide between the context of discovery, which is just as significant as the context of explanation. And you have them all because you are taking it, as Fiona said, from the design stage to the product stage, uh, so that you go from the origins and have the whole process. And that is why I think your methodology can be applied to anything pretty much uh, to capture the entirety of uh, reality. What I'm curious about, and you know, women seem to be obsessed with shoes and I am too, uh, is uh, of course the knockoffs. Uh, you know, you obviously went to the experts and all that, but then there is this whole clandestine industry of uh, sort of making shoes that look like uh, the main brands. I mean, do you have any idea about how sort of the underground shoe processing works? Um, that's my question, thank you. Yeah, so that's another chapter that we ended up deciding <laughs> that it was too much to do because it was like the next circuit. But, you know, just to say a couple of easy things, like one of the interesting things is like, shoes, you know, like clothing, don't have the same copyright limitations than other aesthetic products. As long as you're not imitating the swoosh of Nike or like the red thing of Louboutin or things like that, there are of course attempts to sue people. But if anything, the interesting thing is even looking at the experts I'm looking at, I'm looking at knockoffs all the time. Because this is an industry where like the idea of invention, I mean, especially if you're producing six to nine collections a year of like 20 to 30 shoes, you know, it's like a no offense to Chicago. It's like the publishing industry. How many new things you can, can you really say all the time? You know, like there can be like 130 shoes that are all new and fantastic. And so what tends to happen is you see things moving and, and the question is kind of like Harvey question, who moves them and how, right? Like from one market circuit to the next. And so the next one, there's like two different thi like things. One is like what people call shoe dogs. And that's like a very masculine thing. And usually it's like the next level. So are the people that are just copying the mid-tier market that I studied, um, but with fewer constructions. And so that's an important part of the story. Like the cheaper you're doing the product, the least, you're doing and the more you're like, okay, you're like stealing uppers to see how it looks on like the stuff you already have. Um, but the other thing too is like factories in China, and, and I know this from hanging out with the designers and going to a whole fake Walmart. So there was a Walmart that wasn't a Walmart. It was just called Walmart and it was a giant mall supermarket thing. So there you could buy bags, Louis Vuitton bags and whatever. And it was all, they're fake. No, they're actually not fake. They're like the factory throws them away because they might have like a tiny speck inside, you know, when you open it or because they needed to do 2000, but they end up doing 4000. And so they try to make money of it. So you're actually buying like a non-sanctioned original that appears as a knockoff, right? If that makes sense. So I don't know if this, you know, because it wasn't like my main, like a uh, kind of like market segment, but hopefully this illuminated some. And, and then if Fatma and Harvey can want to write a paper about my method, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Laura. Hi, Claudio. Thank you so much um, uh, to you and to the organizers and the respondents. This has been really fun. Um, and I've learned a lot. And I haven't read the book yet. Um, so uh, 
that's a caveat. I'm wondering um, about the, a, a distinction though, in terms of sort of an she was method, you know, this ethnography of assemblage, what's being animated here, what, what, what is being assembled and how, if the focus on gender should maybe shift or open up or broaden to, it's really not about women, it's about the feminine. Um, and the degree to which, uh, you know, gay queer, gay, queer culture, especially gay men, trans women, I mean, there's, there are lots of um, constituents who presumably are part of the design world, um, but also pr probably part of the cheap labor world, who, um, who's aesthetics and preferences um, and ways of being in the world are part of this animation of the object um, in time and space. And so I, I just wonder about that slippage between, I don't think we're really talking about women, we're talking about the feminine. Um, and I guess it's just, it's more of a comment than a question or I invite you to sort of think through that. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I think there is a big part of it that has to do going back to Harvey with the feminine as a particular aesthetic way of inhabiting the world. But also going back to Fiona, the reality is like this like very gender work in terms of who gets to ask what. Like, and so it's super clear the designer mm -hmm. are women in, you know, I've been in a lot of teams, mostly straight mostly white, even though like a couple of like the main characters in the book are actually not white, but um, technicians tend to be mostly men and interestingly enough, straight men and like what I expected. Uh, and office girls are all like uh, Chinese women and from the, again, hanging out in social occasions and whatnot, it seems like they mostly tend to identify as heterosexual, but you know, like, again, it's not like a, I, I haven't thought of that like in us in the partially once again, because this is like the mid tier market. It's neither the cheapest nor the most creative, interesting. So my guess is like probably the feminine queer, like that might be something that might be much better answered by people who are working, you know, like at sort of like the top level in different ways, right? Either because it's like small creative outside of like these large mid tier corporations or on the higher end which is, you know, where like a lot of the things get what I've got started. Yeah. Sense. Yeah, I mean, no, I think partly what I was, I was getting at, and I think you hit, hit the nail on the head, is that there's a gender politics to the work and the yeah. workers, but yeah. there's a different kind of gender politics to the aesthetics and the object and what all gets animated. So thank you. So we have uh, Michael and we are, kind of over time, so probably this is the last one, I guess. Uh, Michael? Yeah, so one of the questions that I had is the uh, uh, performance of uh, of the shoes that um, uh, that is uh, expressed through the uh, consumer of these shoes. Did you get into that in this book as well? Uh, the negotiation between the, uh, well, yeah, the negotiations ongoing between performance and then structures and norms and expectations and how these shoes are worn, but then also um, moving uh, a movement from the other side as to how the consumer is taking on these shoes and pushing back at the, uh, at the social structure. Yeah. No, I, to be honest, I have not partially because as I've already been told many times what I've done is a little bit insane. So I did think of our next layer and actually I think very early on in the project before Andrew Diner ended up doing also like a fantastic ethnography or infrastructure, but like of, you know, like food in Philadelphia, we had thought of doing something together and he will be doing because of his previous expertise with Benny's something more on consumption and distribution. But then, you know, we each wrote our own book, even though we were chatting with one another a lot. But there's almost nothing on consumption other than like a few scenes where I'm with designers seeing how they are looking at consumers uh, and how they are imagining the consumers. Can I contradict the author a, a little bit here? Uh, because I think, I mean, for me, there was a bit of the story that touches on what Michael is saying, which for me was fascinating, which is how designers look at 
how people wear the shoes as inspiration for their designs. So it's not that, you know, it's part of the uh, book as a chapter, but it's part of the story because, I mean, that's one of the starting points for designers are, you know, how others are wearing the shoes. The consumers are appropriating those designers and that is source of inspiration for them. So that's just one thing that I think it is there somehow. Well, thank you. I told you have to sell the book. I know, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank All you so right. much. So, Kari, I think. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Fernando, Fiona, and Harvey for being great respondents. And thank you, Claudio, for giving us such a great excuse to come together. We're so happy to celebrate the perfect fit. Um, thanks for everyone for attending. Um, the recording of the video will be on our YouTube channel in another couple of weeks. Um, so you can direct anyone who couldn't get here today um, to find it online as well as um, archival videos from our other uh, book talks. And um, thank you all. And thanks to the Seminary Co-op, our partner in these events who has done a lot of great promotion and there is a link um, to their book page as well where you can buy the book. All right, thank you all. <laughs>